Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Nelson, AASHTO's SciCop coordinator, and welcome to today's webinar, the fourth in our series of showcasing the use of technology in achieving the maintenance mission. SciCop, AASHTO's Winter Maintenance Technical Service Program, is teaming up with the Maintenance Operations Technical Working Group of the uh, Committee on Maintenance and the Community of Practice on Road Weather Management from the Committee on Transportation System Operations to bring you this webinar. You can find out more about these groups over at the AASHTO website, transportation.org, and click on the About tab. Now, there are many great projects being deployed across the country to advance the delivery of the maintenance mission and to improve mobility, particularly during weather events. These state showcase webinars are an opportunity to share with others who may very well be facing similar problems. On behalf of SICOP, the Maintenance Operations TWIG, and the Community of Practice on Road Weather Management, I want to thank our presenters today for agreeing to share their projects with us. If you've missed any of our previous webinars showcasing maintenance technologies, you can find the full webinar recordings on the SICOP Talks Winter Ops website, along with all of our podcast episodes on winter maintenance related topics at SICOPTalksWinterOps.com. Now for the next 60 minutes, our presenters will brief you on their use of technology to address some unique challenges in their operations. But before we get started, I want to let you know that all attendees are in listen-only mode. There will be time for our presenters to respond to questions, so please use the chat pod in the lower right-hand side of your screen to post your questions. And I'd like to remind you that the webinar again is being recorded and will be available on the SICOP Talks Winter Ops website. Our first presenter today is Vince Garcia from the Wyoming DOT, and our second presentation will be by Jeremy McGuffey from the Indiana DOT and Darcy Bullock of the Purdue University. So with that, let me make Vince our presenter. Okay, is the presentation coming through clearly, Rick? Yes, it is. All right, um, again, my name is Vince Garcia. Rick, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak to your group. Um, I kind of feel like I'm the warm up act for Jeremy and Darcy because they've got a really great presentation. I saw it earlier and it's a, you're gonna really enjoy that one. Um, regardless, I'm gonna provide you some background information about our operations in the state of Wyoming. Um, I'm gonna focus on a transportation management center and our goals, I'll pro provide you some statistics. I'll also tell you how we kind of work with maintenance and it might be a little bit unusual. Um, for some people who don't have kind of a tight relationship between their TMC and their uh, maintenance staff. But the group I lead is called the GIS ITS program. And within YDOT, our group has employees who are responsible for contract plans and deployment of ITS devices, the development of software and the support of that software that supports our ITS systems, the operations of ITS devices, the dispatching of maintenance personnel, and finally, we have a team of employees who maintain the ITS devices in the field. Um, our transportation management center is, let's see if I can show that, there it is, is um, their responsibilities are really bounded by this gray box and I'm gonna focus on them for just a bit. So um, I, I, I also wanna kind of highlight the fact that we would not be successful if we didn't have such a tight relationship with our maintenance teams. Um, we get a lot of crashes. Um, weather plays a major role in the multi-vehicle crashes that we see all too commonly in Wyoming. And occasionally we have multi-vehicle crashes in the summer, but generally they're still weather related. Blowover crashes are very common in Wyoming. And to put a fine point on it, our peak wind gust this last year at a wind prone area that's very well known was about 118 miles an hour. And this is the type of events that we get. Um, blowover crashes are very, very common. Uh, this is just one of the major locations that we see them. And uh, we do a lot to close with our maintenance employees. We close the road to, to um, light high profile vehicles when crosswinds exceed 60 miles an hour. That's a very common event for us. But when it brings the vast majority of our weather related crashes, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about the first two crashes I'm kind of highlighting here um, in, in a presentation a little bit later, but we had a crash on I-80 on J January 31st of this year that involved multiple vehicles. And I'm gonna show you that video. Um, there's the the crashes in April of 2015, uh, two back to back were, were kind of um, instrumental in making some changes in our organization. But uh, this most recent one, again, I'm gonna show you just a little clip of a video. 
Hopefully you can hear the audio. And this happened just about three weeks ago. Josh! Josh! Hold on! Hold on! Um, hopefully you got to hear some of that audio. I think it was pretty impactful. And certainly uh, one good thing I can tell you is no one was killed in that crash. We had about 20 to 24 vehicles pile up. Um, but in terms of the way we operate from top to bottom in White Ops organization, we work to make roads safe. And this starts with prevention um, of problems in the first place through the use of good geometric design and by analyzing terrain to account for blowing snow and shadows on roadways. Um, when these efforts aren't able to prevent a problem, we deploy mitigation techniques such as slope flattening and um, snow fences. And we have a lot of snow fences in the state of Wyoming. And finally, when neither of these measures work, we try to look for an ITS solution. Um, I'm gonna speak to about our Transportation Management Center. And again, it's a 365 day a year, 24 hour operation and it is a statewide center. Um, the goal of our program is to align with the goals with the department, and we focus on the safe and effective transportation system. We emphasize to all of our employees that our job is to reduce crashes, closures, and fatalities, and if we can do this, we inherently promote the safety and efficiency of the roadway network. So we feel we achieve our goals by attempting to change driver behavior through the use of timely and accurate information, um, advisories, recommendations, and forecasts. And the TMC also is the primary element to engage regulatory systems, such as variable speed limits, road closures, chain logs. We deploy and operate many roadside information systems that are common to most states, such as the electronic message boards that are seen all over the country, environmental sensors, cameras, speed sensors, variable speed limits, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But we also have um, numerous pre-trip information systems. Um, and some of those have some statistics I just not want to share with you just to show you how, how important weather is to the state of Wyoming. We only have about 580,000 people. And I don't know a single family that isn't checking our systems on a very regular basis. Uh, moving left to right from the, the, on this graphic, we uh, provide push notifications to subscribers via text and email uh, through a product we call 511 Notify. We have about 58,000 subscribers to this service. Um, we provide probably the state's most popular website. It's uh, 1.6 billion hits to it in 2018. And our telephone system, which is, um, we're seeing a decline in the number of calls, which, but it's still about 500,000 a year, down from a peak of about 1.9 million calls placed before we started doing the push notifications. We provide road forecasts to commercial vehicle operators through our commercial vehicle operator portal. We have about 1,700 registered users that represent all but two states, I believe, and several Canadian provinces. And finally, the newest information system that we provide serves as both kind of an in-route system and a pre-trip system. And it's our mobile app, which is, has about 270, 275,000 downloads to date. Um, it's only been in operation for a few years. And uh, with a population of about 580,000, we're pretty pleased with the and amount of uptake on that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, road closure gates and how we work with our maintenance people now, if, if I can just uh, kind of spin the, the topic a little bit. Um, as a background, and I believe it was in 1995 um, that YDOT crash tested a vertical style gate arm with a slip base that's now deployed all over our state and, and many other states have adopted it. Uh, because this gate passed crash tests, it doesn't require guardrail, which tends to present its own problems due to blowing snow and, and uh, the uh, drifting that happens because of blowing snow. Um, this slide just shows a, a graphic of some of the crash test still photos that were um, taken back in the testing phase. And it de demonstrates that the, the base slips and that the gate flips over the top of a car at highway speeds. The, the series of photos is actually kind of goes like this, if you would. But roads are rarely closed when conditions are good. 
Um, really, these gates are only, well, not only, but generally used when we have uh, whiteout conditions or a crash due to, to weather conditions that prevent uh, movement on the roadway. So cranking of these gates puts our employees at, at, in a bad position, especially in the middle of a snowstorm. So we wanted to find a solution and our team worked to deploy an automated road closure gate system using a linear actuator. Uh, we use a controller that allows plow operators to use a garage door style of clicker that's, that starts the advanced warning beacons and then closes the gate without uh, the need for the employee to leave the vehicle. A uh, few of these are completely automated such that the TMC can control them. And we're planning to deploy more of this type of uh, controller because it allows us to open the gate much faster than if we needed to send an employee to get to a, a gate that might be miles down the highway. The linear actuator can always be disconnected and the cranking mechanism can be attached if the system fails for any reason, power or mechanical failure, for example. I think the safety benefits of the system are obvious because employees aren't having to get out of their vehicles and in the traffic stream. Then I'm gonna spin and talk a little bit about variable speed limits if I could. Um, as background, we have, uh, like I told you, we have far too many multi-vehicle pileups with fatalities caused by whiteout conditions and uh, poor surface conditions. The two crashes I mentioned earlier happened almost at, um, excuse me, there were two crashes that happened almost at the same milepost in successive years that um, resulted in, in many fatalities. And one was a prominent Colorado family that was killed uh, in Wyoming on Interstate 80 on their way to a Christmas holiday in 2007. And as a result of that, in 2008, the Wyoming legislature passed legislation um, that allows for us to um, use variable speed limits um, on fixed or variable signs, excuse me, uh, speed limits on fixed or variable signs, and we can use them due to a weather or a vehicle emergency. Um, our first deployment was done in concert with the University of Wyoming as a research project in 2009. Um, our goal was to tighten the speed distribution because we felt we can eliminate a lot of vehicle conflicts by doing this. Um, key to the to total process, and I wanna give credit to them, is the cooperation that we see between patrol and maintenance and the TMC, all of which have the authority to reduce or raise the speed limits as conditions warrant. Generally, if we have boots on the ground and someone tells us there's a really bad condition, um, we will make the speed adjustments that they suggest in their absence, we have a algorithm that's kind of based on stopping site distance and um, has, has been uh, it's a formula originally developed by the University of Wyoming to, to uh, post speed limits out of the TMC. Uh, currently we have seven locations. The first one that we deployed was in this area on Interstate 80. Um, it was so successful that uh, we have begun to deploy more and more of them and there are more plans on the horizon. So. Um, our, our focus again is to tighten the speed distribution. And the way we, are, we focus that is um, if you look at this graphic and, and uh, if I just look at across the horizontal, there's 100 vehicles traveling 55 miles an hour. And in the green um, bell-shaped curve, there's also 100 vehicles traveling 95 miles an hour. This was all theoretical, I made this up. But our goal is to take that speed distribution and tighten it up so it looks more like the, the purple um, graph. We also want to make those speed adjustments so that they are appropriate for conditions. So based on stopping site distance and the physics of, uh, of being able to close a vehicle down, sh shut it down, um, that's really our approach. Here's a real world histogram of the speed distribution at uh, one of our sites when we were first doing the testing and the analysis. On a dry and clear day, we get a, a traditional kind of histogram. Um, the speed distribution is pretty normal. Uh, the average, excuse me, the posted speed limit of 75 miles per hour shown there. When the storm begins to impact, you see the speed distribution starting to spread out. And we're actually seeing vehicles traveling, probably panicking, but traveling 32 miles an hour, while others were traveling in the 83 mile per hour speed range, causing more and more vehicle conflicts, especially if you throw some visibility into that problem. Finally, when the VSLs go into effect, that speed distribution does in fact tighten up. And this is just kind of the onset of that um, VSL going into effect. So the process continues. 
if we don't get the VSL um, turned up fast enough, we start to see that speed distribution um, start um, spreading out again. So it's important for us to make sure that when the speed, when the weather clears, that we get that speed uh, adjusted back up again. Um, we have, like I said, had a, we still have a large number of multi-vehicle crashes. Um, we seem to never be able to get away from them. Um, uh, I, I talked to you about those two um, crashes that happened in April of 2015. And the fact is we still are seeing these, like I said, multi-vehicle crashes, but the severity is reduced. And in a zone, like I'm showing here on the left-hand side of the screen, we had uh, a crash April 16, 2015. About 60 vehicles were involved. Variable speed limits were set to 45 miles per hour because the TMC had seen the snow squall move in. Um, there was a bad crash, there's no question about it, but uh, the reality is um, there were no fatalities and uh, everybody basically walked away from that. Just a, less than a week later, another crash in a zone that was about one mile from a variable speed limit uh, took place. Similar, very similar situation, uh, almost the same number of vehicles. Uh, this one, people came in much faster at 75 miles an hour. There were two fatalities and a much more catastrophic crash. So I'm also wanted to talk to you just a bit about, um, and, and if I could just make maybe one more comment about this. We have heard from our maintenance employees that when we reduce the speeds, they get a better opportunity to drop sand and that sand gets ground into the, into the bad surface condition better than if it were at higher speeds and people were bouncing the, the material off the roadway. Speaking a little bit about information to and from the public, we have uh, deployed um, a 511 mobile app and um, we get a lot of requests for information as I pointed out. This is the last system that we have deployed and, and it provides both pre-trip and in-route information for drivers. It also functions has functions that allow you to find out where you are on the transportation network and for passengers to send pictures or condition updates to the transportation management center. Um, all the photos in this presentation and the pictures that you're seeing have been sent to the TMC using this mobile app. Um, the app is available for download for iOS and Android. And um, here's the kind of the first function. It uh, provides um, a, a map that's intended for pre-trip. It has layers that include road conditions and incidents, cameras, road construction, weather stations, and truck parking. The truck parking layer actually um, allows people to send information about truck parking availability that can be shared with other drivers kind of in a crowdsourced uh, fashion. Um, the hands-free iFree function is intended to provide drivers with information while they're on the road. Uh, conditions are read to them. They don't have to do anything except turn the phone on and set and forget it, make sure their GPS is on and the system relays information to them as they come upon it. It only reads conditions that are on the highways that they're on, uh, and it will read conditions and closures um, and incidents for routes that are within a radius. We have a where am I function that is used a lot by um, our own internal folks as well as the public. Um, it's really necessary because we're a very rural state and people don't understand lat longs, but they do understand routes and mileposts. Um, the system converts the phone's GPS location to the nearest tenth of a mile, and it can be used to send information to others. Um, there's a texting capability with it. Um, it packages up the information and makes it available to the person's contact list. Um, the system also allows passengers to submit photos, which are sent to the TMC, and if appropriate, they're distributed to all kinds of um, our, our all of our systems, um, much like a stationary web camera would be. All the pics are geolocated and the text can be sent to help clarify what is being seen by the person who submits the picture. The way it works is a person takes a picture on their mobile app, um, an alert uh, in phase two if it, on this graphic is sent to the TMC. They recognize that there's a, an image sent. They can review that image and this all takes place in about, uh, about a second. Um, and then if it's appropriate, they can post that so that it's available to the public and all of our information systems. Um, here's a few images that have been submitted. 
And you can you can see how this would be beneficial if a person came upon this type of an avalanche in this case, um, how our maintenance people could benefit from it. They weren't out there, they weren't aware of it, they were made aware of it by virtue of uh, the public providing information. We get crash reports. There's three examples of various crash reports, including a, a vehicle fire. We also see um, images being submitted of uh, stop traffic, which can infer a, a crash ahead uh, or some sort of a problem on the transportation network. And then we also get condition reports. And I, um, these are very commonly submitted to us. This one, believe it or not, on the right, I want to point out is, is not snow. That's actually a May hailstorm from last year. Um, we also have wet employees who are submitting images. So um, when they need to get make the public aware of something, they can take images. So they're working on a problem. This happened to be a landslide, the center's um, image here happened to be a landslide that happened last May, um, common in the springtime in this area. So um, we can make people aware of the progress that we're making, even if we don't have a web camera in the immediate area. Um, and then most recently, this happened just uh, on February 15th, just a few weeks ago now, we had a situation where the road was closed. Um, this road, and uh, was closed in one direction and people didn't understand why we were getting lots of complaints. Um, with a mobile app, a person could submit an image. We had a, a major drift that happened in a very isolated location and our maintenance employees were able to get this information in and maybe take some of the pressure off of them to, to get the road open. And with that, that's kind of concludes my presentation. I hope I stayed within time, Rick and um, kept us on track. My contact information is there. And I don't know if you want to wait for questions till the end or if you want to, to ask for them. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Vince. Um, we, we did have uh, two very, very quick questions and maybe you can answer this while I'm making the uh, switch over to Jeremy. Uh, the first one came in from Philip uh, Anderley and his question has to do with the population of Wyoming, he says, it seems like your call volume is impressive for a state with not a lot of residents. Um, maybe you could uh, just quickly uh, answer that while Jeremy's yeah. coming on. It's actually off the chart. Um, the, the amount of requests for information, what, whether it be the mobile app, the, the website, the, the telephone system, all um, probably are overrepresented. We joke within our program that there's no other entertainment in the state of Wyoming. I don't know that that's necessarily true, but there's certainly a lot of um, very severe weather events and getting good information and good intelligence before they get on the road is very important to Wyoming residents. There's a lot of very, uh, there's very sparsely populated state, meaning that we have distances, vast distances where you may not see anybody for hours. And if uh, you're not well prepared, um, you could be in in serious jeopardy in a, in a winter storm. A storm. All winter. right, very good. I think uh, I'd like to go ahead and hold uh, the other questions until later. Uh, Jeremy, it looks like you're queued up and uh, if you're ready, go ahead and proceed. Yeah, can you confirm that you can hear me? I can in fact hear you and I can see your screen. Sounds great, all right. Thank you again, Vince. That was uh, some good stuff there. I, I particularly like the, uh, the crowdsourcing data for the mobile application from the public there. Anyways, uh, everybody, I am Jeremy McGuffey. I'm from NDOT. I'm the statewide winter ops. And then uh, also on the line is Darcy Bullock. And I believe G. Joe is also on the line and they're from Purdue University. Uh, Darcy is our uh, JTRP or Joint Transportation Research Program Director. And uh, anyways, uh, we're gonna be talking about the smart brine tanker that we're, we've been working on today as well as kind of the, the JTRP program itself. So anyways, let me, there we go. All right, so the, the kind of the message behind this and the reason that we're including uh, Purdue on here uh, in this discussion is what we're doing here couldn't be possible without them. It takes both, you know, the government, the DOTs, as well as academia, you know, 
the Purdue's of this world, all of the, the universities that help out, help us out as well as uh, industry partners, as you'll see here in a little bit, to actually make that, that big impact. So again, uh, kind of our team here that, that was working on this project from the get-go, uh, we have in this room right here, or in this, this frame, we have uh, Darcy and the Purdue team and myself, uh, a couple of our uh, district uh, managers, and then also uh, from McGavick Power Equipment, uh, who is our uh, vent or equipment vendor who actually outfitted the truck. They're in there as well. We've all been working on this project for quite some time, and uh, it's uh, really, really something. Anyways, to kind of break that down even further, we McGavick right there in the, the bottom right corner, uh, Agrochem, Polaris, Snowax, they've all been uh, great partners in this project, as well as uh, Obviously, the, the NDOT and Purdue folks there, too. So uh, none of this would be uh, possible without active uh, learning from the field. Uh, the Purdue team has spent a bunch of time out in the field with, with all of our uh, maintenance employees trying to learn, you know, what barriers they have and, and how we can overcome them and then applying them in real-world technologies. So here's an outline of what we're gonna to talk to you today. Uh, so the motivation behind this project, as well as the existing technologies that kind of helped shape that, uh, the concept framework uh, and the decision-making you know, process that went into it, uh, as well as the small-scale prototype that we built earlier last year, yeah, earlier last year, and then uh, where we're at currently with the Smart Brian Tanker. And then the features that, uh, that that smart brine tanker that we have on there, and then any future work that we have scheduled as well. <clears throat> so the motivation behind this project is uh, something that's pretty common to all of us, I would assume, at least the my, the, my colleagues that I work with. Uh, so we all have a, a shortage of experienced plow drivers, right? The workforce is starting to age and, and uh, you know, we, we get a lot of younger drivers in there and, and it's just not the same as it used to be. And that's coming from me, who's young. So, uh, anyways, uh, you know, some other motivations are the safety aspect. Uh, eventually, we want to get to the point where the driver is just focused on driving. We don't want them messing with uh, controls and switches and knobs. Uh, we just want somebody to be able to focus on the road. And I think that's really going to be the uh, the big takeaway once we finish this project. <clears throat> so. With existing technologies, what kind of helped uh, shape this was the agriculture industry of all things. Uh, for a while now that we've had self-driving uh, crop sprayers and, and all sorts of uh, implements. So we actually did as much as we could to, to utilize that existing technology. So what we did is, is we installed, uh, I'll talk to it here in a little bit, but we actually installed those Raven controllers to our uh, brine tanker. So anyways, uh, same as we do in the field uh, for the agriculture industry, we geofence roadways or bridges or whatever we want to specifically treat, and that's where the system will spray. So here's uh, kind of the decision-making matrix uh, off to the right here. Uh, so some other features here for this system that we, that we really wanted to, to touch on that we put in there was uh, the system automatically turns on and off. Uh, it also controls the application pretty precisely, so uh, and it goes into that rate control there. So we, we set what rate we want the system to spray at, and no matter how quickly the driver's uh, driving, the system will adjust up and down to, to match that rate that we're trying to hit. Uh, it also keeps track of where the driver's already been, uh, so we don't have any double applications unless we intend that to be the case. So uh, if the, the driver is driving over a lane that he's already sprayed uh, or that the system's already sprayed, the system will actually cut off right as soon as he hits that area because it's uh, it's already been tracked. And then there's also the ability to job sync. So if we had two, uh, two trucks out there doing uh, uh, anti-icing, then they could actually work together to, to treat an area and they wouldn't be overlapping as well. So here's a Speaking of the prototype, this is the vehicle that we had initially built. Uh, so this is a Polaris Gym vehicle. It's zero emission electric vehicle that uh, Purdue had put together and they're actually using it at the campus now for anti-icing. Uh, it's 
pretty cool. So they have a uh, the Raven interface that we actually have implemented on our large trucks now that they installed. Uh, there's a the Raven GPS receiver up top as well as the antennas. Those antennas are uh, pretty nice. They they've got us down to uh, I think one to two centimeter uh, accuracy. And then the uh, the gym chassis there as well as all the uh, snow and ice equipment on the back from uh, Bitgavik. So the the here, the next slide will help us out here. So the uh, one thing I wanted to touch on was the nozzles. So while we all have different types of nozzles, uh, this setup that they built specifically for this uh, can actually switch between all of them. So if we wanted to test out different types of flows and, and treatments, uh, you know, we can here. So anyways, uh, that was our prototype. We built it small scale just so we could get it off the ground. Again, all the driver has to do is get in the vehicle and drive the system. Has, as long as it's been geofenced, will automatically spray everywhere that he drives. So here's kind of the interface that we're looking at uh, with the Raven. If you're familiar with uh, AG, then you've probably seen it before. Uh, and those colors are, aren't really uh, relevant right now, but you could specify different zones where you might have a, a higher application in one zone, or you might geofence all of your bridges specifically. Uh, stuff like that. So uh, you can see where it's been tracking him driving around the those zones and the uh, green and red is actually where it's sprayed. Uh, one also the other thing to mention is on the prototype vehicle, uh, each of the nozzles was built specifically to uh, spray independently. So uh, as he's driving, if he overlaps even slightly, then the nozzles will kick off uh, one on one by one to to help that. So here's those antennas I was talking about, uh, the RTKs. Uh, they were paired with the Raven system. Again, that gives them one to two centimeter precision, which is pretty darn precise, if you ask me. Uh, so the slingshot modem and the, the web interface were also used in conjunction with the Raven for uh, putting together the, the mapping and the, uh, keeping, basically being the brains behind it. Here's a video of an action, actually. So the top there, you can actually see the in-cab video. Uh, there's a slight pot or slight delay, but you can actually see every time he hits one of the uh, geofenced areas, the nozzles will kick on on the, the Polaris vehicle. I got to, to drive this, actually, at the Purdue campus. It was pretty, pretty interesting, especially whenever uh, we first started talking about this project. It was just cool to see that we could accomplish this. So, and, and it's demonstrating that automatic shutoff too. So every time the driver leaves that geofenced area, the system knows to kick off. And since it tracks where he has been and where he hasn't been, you can see it kicks on and off as he's making these loops just to demonstrate that. Pretty cool. Uh, so this is a uh, also of that same trip. This is the uh, the map of it, and this is actually what you'd be able to to get uh, through that software. So it shows it shows uh, off to the right there the if the rate was too high or low, or you know just to keep him uh, keep him in line there. So anyways, uh, the next step after that, uh, in the summer, we started talking about how we were going to scale this system up to NDOT uh, level, or at least to meet our needs. So we took a trip out to the, the Greenfield District, which is in southern, or, uh, sorry, central Indiana. And uh, kind of, uh, we, we met with McGavick and we met with Purdue, and we started taking measurements and determining what all would be needed to, to implement this system. So anyways, uh, again, this has been a great project, uh, especially because of the collaboration with the, the field employees in the Greenfield District. So anyways, uh, after a few months of, of working on this project, uh, this is kind of what we came up with. It's, it's one of our brine tankers that we use for interstate spraying, and uh, McGavick had it in their shop for a while. Uh, this is kind of, this is what we were looking at before. Uh, and then afterwards, they put that that Raven module in the back, and they adjusted the uh, the uh, the routing of the liquid in the back just to meet the needs. But 
anyways they separated each of the channels so you have left right and center channel each controlled individually by the raven similarly to, to how each of the nozzles were controlled individually on the uh, polaris prototype vehicle so again uh the rtk and the, the gps receiver for the uh the raven system are up, mounted up there above the cab the raven interface is off to the side kind of uh still within the driver's view but not enough to uh distract so uh we have tested this out and in a second i'll show you a video it's uh it's working pretty well the uh the idea behind the separating them by those center left and right channels was so that we could uh possibly spray ramps and gore areas and, and you know stuff that uh you don't want to keep those all the way you know keep them on all the time for uh, i think this is our video yeah, here we go so uh, this is just a demonstration where we geofenced a, uh, a bridge deck to go ahead and spray it. There is a delay between the, the Raven screen up in the corner and then the truck, but uh, it's just to demonstrate that we can, that the proof of concept was there and it's it's been fully implemented. Underpasses as well. So this is another one that, that we might have to go back and revisit. Uh, the only issue that I've seen with the underpasses is that as the driver passes under, uh, the cellular signal or the, the modem signal kind of goes wonky. So there towards the end, you see kind of the on the, the map interface that he's uh, bouncing all over the place. But other than that, it, it works great. He's still kicked on and off where he should have. Uh, Eventually, we'll get to the point where we have all of our interstate system uh, geofenced, so he can, you know, head out there and, and spray everything. Uh, but there are situations where here in Indiana, uh, we we just do the bridges and any trouble spots, and that's just because we we might have light storms moving in. So again, we talked about this. Uh, that RTK, uh, those antennas allow us to be precise with those treatments. Uh, that one to two centimeters makes a big difference because if you watch this in, in real time or in person, as soon as you overlap, it kicks off right there and it, and it you know, it sprays right up until your, uh, your next uh, area. <clears throat> so this is kind of the dashboard. Uh, I can see this being uh, implemented with people that have existing AVL as well in their trucks, uh, but this is kind of what Raven has built in. So you can click on any of these breadcrumbs and it'll tell you the uh, the output as well as any of the basic AV or yeah, AVL uh, or telematics information. Another feature that we were talking about is uh, job sync. So uh, eventually we'll get to the point where we can send multiple vehicles that have been equipped with the uh, system out into the field and they'll be able to work together to attack the same uh, job that's been specified. So if we identify, you know, one segment of uh, the interstate, they can both go out there and spray it and still not overlap. Again, back to the overlap, this is showing where it could kick on and off just because of uh, the, you know, the geofences that are in place and it tracking your previous work. So again, uh, future work, this is actually gonna be the, the biggest and most exciting part. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we are where we are, but uh, and all the steps that we've taken to get there, but uh, the best is yet to come. So uh, the next step for us is actually going to be taking Marwis and using that as basically a decision matrix for the uh, the system that we have. So right now, what we have is is perfect for uh, pre-treating, but as soon as we start getting into this next step of of implementing Marwis being the brains of the operation. Uh, it can look at road conditions and then make adjustments to the application rate. Uh, and I think that that's, that's cool in itself. So I'm really, uh, really happy that Darcy and team are working on that. Uh, you know, speaking of, you know, that's, that's just the next step there, but, but the overarching goal whenever we put together this project was uh, to have uh more features automated. So whenever I talked about having drivers behind the wheel and only focused on driving, uh, I meant that. So once we get past implementing Marwis, the next step logically for us uh, to finish out this project is actually that Marwis making decisions for not only application rates, but for plowing as well. So uh, 
uh, if it see if it's measuring that there's a specified number of, or amount of snow on the ground, it would drop the plow. So and and I feel like that would be super cool to to get accomplished. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, again, o overall goal of this project is to automate the the features of the plowing and then uh, let the drivers focus on the road. So with that said, I know I kind of blasted through that, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm open as well. All right, <clears throat> all right, Jeremy, outstanding. Um, be before we uh, before we leave, uh, Darcy, you uh, you were there. Uh, is is there any comments that you'd like to make about this project uh, since you're on? And uh, no, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, no, I just think I think Jeremy gave an outstanding. Uh, summary uh, it's been a, a, a great partnership great team effort and um i guess the part that i the other part that i think is exciting is uh vince in his uh opening slides from wyoming talked about uh some of the speed data and i would just add uh one of the things that we're working aggressively on is using the inrix probe data to measure both real-time conditions and kind of outcome assessment during the winter storm and that's the the other component of of this that's been uh been a, a, a i think very synergistic with some of the uh material that uh vince presented all right we do have uh, several questions uh here uh i what i'll do is just sort of uh roll through them uh the first question is for vince uh, and it's coming from Randy. The, the question is, did Wyoming build their own app or did a consultant do it? So we designed the app. We had a contractor build it, but we own the code. We've actually had improvements made by a separate contractor um, and we can share the code with anybody. All right, outstanding. Uh, the next question uh, comes from Philip uh, and this one's for you, Jeremy or, or Darcy. And the question is, can the driver trigger the system to spray before they reach a geofenced area? Jeremy, I mean, I'll take that. Yeah, yes, the, the system has a manual override to, to trigger that, Phil. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, our next question comes from Scott. Uh, is Indiana planning on using the same spray tech for herbicide applications? So I think I'll that it's very possible. What, what was that, Darcy? I was going to volley that to you, which is perfect. You answered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that that that's perfectly uh, uh, acceptable question. I I I think there's potential there for sure. Uh, Indiana, however, is uh, switching more towards contracted spraying, so we're coming at a bad time. But uh, but yeah, I think there definitely is potential there. All right, Andrew ans uh, asked the next question, uh, Jeremy. Uh, how did your field staff react to the automation of application? Uh, specifically, did you get any pushback that they were being watched? Uh, so we've we've only currently implemented on the uh, that one brine tanker, uh, and we've not had any any negative feedback uh, for this project. I think most of the negative feedbacks always came from ABL because people people think that they're being tracked through that, but but through this project, I think they kind of understand where we're coming from. Uh, however, we we have been directed to uh, install more of these systems, so maybe we'll we'll get some more feedback as we go. And do you have ABL on your fleet already? Uh, we have had it several times. We currently do not, but uh, we finished up our contract with Parsons. Or we at least uh, started our contract with Parsons here. A couple months ago, so we will actually be getting our third round of ABL installs next month or the month after. Okay. Um, Philip asks uh, Jeremy, how reliable is the GPS receiver during heavy snowfall or thick clouds? Well, it remains to be seen. Uh, we've only had limited testing on this, but uh, I don't expect it to be too much of an issue. Okay. Uh, Scott asked Jeremy, can you designate between the left and right side of the roadway? Uh, Darcy, do you know? 
Uh, yes, 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 we can. And that's that's the purpose of bringing RTK in so we know which lane we're in. And we have worked with Jeremy's team to put solenoid valves on a left and right spray so that we can spray adjacent uh, adjacent turn lanes uh, entry or entry or exit lanes as, as the vehicle goes by. And, and Douglas asks a follow up question. How precise are the controllers? Any problems with determining one lane versus the other in the same direction? So, so this is Darcy again, and that, I think that's the, the, the purpose that we put RTK in is uh, we're for longitudinally, we, we don't really have too much worry about being off 10 or 15 feet, but on interstate type applications, we really want to know lane specific. So. That's why we've gone with the RTK that gets us, we don't need centimeter level precision like ag does, but that gets us definitely lane accuracy. Uh, Philip asks, uh, Jeremy, are there any legal implications with having technology raise and lower the plow or treat or don't treat the roadway? So I think that's definitely gonna be part of the process of uh, this project is researching that uh, Indiana's uh, done a lot of autonomous vehicle work already, and Darcy can probably speak to that, but I don't think that that'll be an issue. I think that's uh, a good answer. I, I agree with Jeremy. I think it's a, an, an under active discussion. Um, Dan asks Jeremy, pictures and discussion was focused on brine distribution with mention of future work with plows. Do you see an applicability to rock salt spreading as well? Yeah, and that was so. Yeah, I was getting at that. I guess I didn't explain it well enough. Uh, with with the whole Marwis uh, decision making uh, element added in there, I think that we'll we'll reach that in our next step. The plow would probably be a final step, but but any kind of material application, whether it's uh, granular or liquids, would would definitely be where we're headed in our our immediate next step. Paul asks, uh, will the MARWIS capability be ready for testing for the 2020-2021 winter? What do you think, Darcy? I definitely think we're gonna we're gonna scale it up. I mean, I don't see right now, I don't see any reason why we won't won't be doing doing that next next season. Okay. Jacob asks, where has it been used? Uh, let's see. Where it's been used, have you noticed a reduction of brine use? So again, the the demos have been uh, pretty limited, uh, and Indiana has been blessed with uh, with good weather this year. So uh, we've not had to send it out full force for a uh, for a uh, any kind of pre-treating, but we've used it uh, basically to proof of concept by sending the tanker out on these predetermined routes just to show that it would work. Uh, so again, remains to be seen. Uh, we just need more time in the field with it. All right. Douglas asks, Jeremy, anti-de-icing makes a lot of sense, but are field crews interested in having road condition responsive plows? So probably not. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the drivers, the boots on the ground, they like to be making their own decisions. Uh, so I, I believe that we'll see some pushback with that. Uh, I don't think that, you know, I don't think it's going to be hard to overcome. Same as AVL, once you show the worth of the uh, the equipment and the technology, I think that you can sell it. Okay. And uh, Paul asks Jeremy, will Indiana DOT or Purdue be publishing a report documenting this work? And then presumably these slides will be available. And that is correct. Uh, the uh, again, the the slides, the recording will be available shortly. Uh, but what about the reports uh, reports for this work? Yeah, so uh, this is actually, and Darcy, you can correct me if I'm wrong. This is one of our SPR funded projects. So uh, once the project is considered finished, there will be an actual report. But we are doing, you know, we're trying to get the word out in the meantime. Uh, we're doing a poster session tomorrow at the the government building in Indianapolis, uh, but but there will be a report once it's concluded. Okay, and I have uh, one last question here for Vince. Um, 
give you a minute to unmute yourself there. Uh, mm -hmm. How long has your TMC uh, been up and running? And uh, I know you've been participating in the um, the pilot study there. Uh, are there future enhancements for your TMC planned in the future? You know, there's always changes being made to the TMC. Um, every time we just had a meeting yesterday and uh, there's at least one uh, participant on this meeting that attended that meeting, we're always trying to, to do after action reviews and, and modify our processes and the way we work with patrol and maintenance. Um, so that's an ongoing process. But the, we went statewide in terms of operational with our TMC in uh, 2008, March of 2008, I believe. Um, and um, prior to that, we had been doing things at the district level. Um, I, I defer to someone else to, to probably speak to how well they like us doing it, but I think the overall uh, feeling, if if I'm reading them correctly, is that they're very pleased with the the, when, the fact that we centralized it and that we're um, able to make progress that might not have been able to be made otherwise. That answers the question. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so we've exhausted uh, the questions that have been submitted. Uh, again, on behalf of uh, SICOP and the Maintenance Operations TWIG, uh, the Community of Practice on Road Weather Management, uh, thank you to uh, Vince, Jeremy, and Darcy for presenting uh, today. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed today's State Showcase webinar. And, and I hope it might have inspired you to want to share something that you've been working on in your operation or, or if you know somebody that's, that's working on uh, a deployment that is uh, uh, really cool and you think they might be interested in sharing, uh, please let me know because uh, we're always looking for uh, interesting topics for future state showcase webinars. So uh, please don't be shy. Uh, email me your, uh, your ideas and, and we'll get something put together. In the meantime, uh, the recording of today's webinar, along with the contact information about our presenters will be available soon on the SICOP Talks Winter Ops website. And uh, with that, I wanna thank you very much for your attention. And that includes today's webinar.